Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be one for the books. Brazil meets their match with the best goalkeeper in the world. The Soviets may be losing, but Yashin has caught, kicked, and even punched some incredible balls today. Oh, look at that. What a save. Yashin covers the goal entirely, like a spider dressed in all black. It's the 1958 World Cup, and the Soviets are not looking great. Oh, you don't have to be so polite. We lost. <laughs> ah, can't win them all. When doors close, windows open. My jersey with the number one left its impression on people's minds that day. It allowed them to imagine what goalkeeping could become. Lev Yashin collected several nicknames throughout his career, including the Black Spider for his dark kit, impressive build, athleticism, and show-stopping performances. Not to mention it appeared as though he had eight arms during play. Yashin was an imposing presence in goal. He was the first goalkeeper to command the entire penalty area and beyond, what came to be known as a sweeper-keeper. He pushed the boundaries of where a goalkeeper could go and what he could do. He acted as another defender, often intercepting attacks and chasing down the ball outside the penalty area. All of this at a time when most goalkeepers stayed in their box. And when Yashin wasn't launching himself at the ball or catapulting himself fearlessly towards an attacker, he was barking orders at his teammates. They keep them outside. Victor, man on. Oh, they loved me, really. From the goal, I got the best view of the pitch. I could see it all, so I just gave them advice. From an outsider's perspective. <laughs> it's that quick wit and charisma that made him a darling of international media. While Yashin is now regarded as possibly the greatest goalkeeper in football history, his story began at a time of turmoil. Born just a few years after the formation of the Soviet Union, and dying just one year before it collapsed, it's impossible to disentangle Yashin's personal and professional history from that of the USSR's. And Lev Yashin, the goalkeeper who dared to think outside the penalty box, remained a loyal hero to the Soviet working class to the very end. I was born Lev Ivanovich Yashin on October 22, 1929, in Moscow, Russia. Well, back then, it was the Soviet Union. My family was working class, and like many Russians at the time, they worked in factories. My father was a locksmith at the Shina Aircraft Factory, and my mother made shoes at a rubber factory. This was Stalin's Soviet Union. The economy operated on five-year plans to rapidly modernize its industry and compete with Western powers. The first five-year plan, launched in 1928, focused on the development of heavy industry in order to transition the Soviet Union into an industrial powerhouse on par with its capitalist counterparts in the West. For the economy, it was a tremendous success, but for the workers, the pressure often wasn't worth the pay. Even with two incomes, my parents couldn't afford rent. We lived in a communal apartment with other factory workers and their kids. We became one big family. Liova, my darling. My mother always called me Liova. Your father and I are off to work. Be good and listen to your aunties. And don't stay up too late if we're not back before night. My childhood was nothing special, but it was happy. Until my mother died of tuberculosis when I was six years old. I was too young to understand why she was lying in a box, and why she didn't move when I kissed her forehead. My father was heartbroken. It wasn't easy for him to raise me on his own. Our house was usually crowded with the other families around, but I still felt lonely. About two years after my mother died, my father remarried. I suppose he felt I needed a mother figure. Luckily, she was kind, and she became a second mother to me. When I was ten, my brother Boris was born. Our family was growing. 
and life felt stable for a while. I remember the first time I touched a football. Wow! Of course, it was nothing like what you're used to today. We used to tie rags together into a ball and run after it. No rules. We were crazy about this game. As soon as we got home from school, all the neighborhood kids would race to the courtyard. Our building was part of a big apartment complex, and the courtyard in the middle was the place to be. You might be surprised to know that I didn't always want to be a goalkeeper. I preferred to play up front, and I scored many goals. They called me Eiffel Tower. I hated that nickname. Ugh. It's not my fault I was taller than most kids my age. I didn't want to stand in goal. Back then, the goalkeeper wasn't part of the game most of the time. What a bore. I'd call out to players, and no one would hear me. It's a wonderful predicament for a child to ponder as war surrounds his city. The Second World War was in its second year when Germany invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941. And by October, the Nazis were closing in on Moscow. People and even entire factories were evacuated to the east. Come on, let's go. We have to catch a train to Ulyanovsk. Your father's work is moving there. Ulyanovsk, the birthplace of Vladimir Lenin, is about 700 kilometers east of Moscow. There, the Soviet people were building a new industrial zone away from the front lines. Nearly 1,500 factories were moved from Moscow to support the war effort. That was the beginning of the Great Patriotic War, as we called it. But for me, that was the day my childhood ended. Life in Ulyanovsk was hard. Factory machines were dismantled and moved out of Moscow, and we, the workers and their families, had to assemble them ourselves and build shadow factories. That winter, I spent days dragging heavy machines through the snow to help my father set up a workshop outside. The factories still had to run, even when they weren't fully built yet. Yashin didn't know he was building the factory that would later become his own workplace. He dropped out of school after the fifth grade and became a locksmith apprentice. Like father, like son. I got a work card, overalls, and everything. I was now a real worker. We slave away all day in this factory. Might as well enjoy a cigarette every now and then. Light up, Liv. Yeah, I picked up that bad habit early in my life. <sighs> On our free days, my father and I collected the clothes and other things that we no longer needed, and packed them on a sled, and walked to the nearest village to trade them for potatoes, oatmeal, flour, uh, whatever we could find, and hoped they would last us till our next free day. Those didn't come by very often. Everyone in my generation struggled. We grew up before our time. On the Eastern Front, our troops have advanced, pushing back the Germans from the Moscow region. It looks like Moscovites could be returning home in a matter of months. And so it was. In early 1944, we packed our things and made our way back home. I was excited to return, but it was strange being back. The buildings were scruffy, cold, and empty. They almost felt haunted. But it didn't matter. They were our homes. We could refill them with new memories. Moscow was getting more crowded by the day as people came back. Relatives, friends, neighbors, people you didn't even know if they were still alive or dead suddenly appeared. It was like a great family reunion all over the city. Yashin left Moscow a child and returned as a teenager in a man's world. The Tashino aircraft factory where he worked 
was returned to its home base too, in northwest Moscow. I had to wake up every morning at five, take two trams and the metro to get to the factory, and in the evening I did it all over again in reverse. By the time I got home, the day was over and I had no energy left. During the war, uh, there was no time for games. No time to roll our rags together into a ball or argue about who stands in goal. But after the war was over, football came back. And it found me on a beautiful spring day in 1945. Look at that! A poster that's not about the war? That's new. Well, let's check it out. Workers wishing to play football sign up for a chance to join the Red October Factory football team. Of course I went. I headed straight to find the coach running the trials. Mm. All right. You, striker. Uh, you, defender. You, uh, you're no good. Go back to work. You, tall. Broad shoulders. Mm. You are a goalkeeper. Oh, well. At least I got to play. Hey! Wait for me! I'm coming! Those few hours I spent playing were the highlight of my day. They made the long trip to and from the factory worth it. They played with their slippers and regular clothes till they fell apart. And the balls? They were torn and repatched probably a hundred times. It didn't matter. We loved every minute of it. Keep shooting, boys! Uh, aim before you shoot! Ah, uh, Yashin, you keep catching balls like this? You're gonna be just fine. Between 1945 and 1947, Yashin's life was stable. Even good at times. He worked and trained during the week, and on the weekends the Red October factory team drove to the stadium in Moscow to play football. It's there where an 18-year-old Yashin really began to show promise as a goalkeeper. But it was also where he had what they called back in the day a nervous breakdown. Suddenly, something in me just snapped. What is happening to me? I'm never like this. I was angry, lashing out at people, getting irritated by the smallest things. Who took my pack of cigarettes? No, I'm sure I left it here. This is not me. This is not me. One day after work, I poured out all of my anger on my family. I don't even remember why. You know what? I'm leaving. You don't have to worry about me anymore. I'm sure whatever happened didn't call for that reaction. I went to stay with a friend from the factory for a while. Hey, Ilva, wake up. It's 5.30. You're going to be late for work. Not going. You know that's not an option left. And we have football practice after. Not going. I don't know what that was. All I know is that I felt nothing and everything all at once. Maybe it was losing my mother, the weight of the war, having to become a man when I was a child. I don't know. But when I was 18, I felt I was re-experiencing every hardship I had ever lived through. There was no help for me. I suppose I didn't know what to ask for. This was 1947 in the Soviet Union. Mental health was not a big thing. But you know what was? Work. And by not going to work, I was breaking the law. The Soviet government had criminalized quitting and absenteeism in the workplace. If caught, young Yashin would have spent up to four months in prison. I felt like I was slipping away. I didn't know what to do. So my friends intervened. Volunteer in the military? No, I never considered it. Well, I guess that would get me out of trouble for missing work. I suppose military discipline might help me get my life in order. It could be my salvation. I'm not sure if it was my salvation, but joining the military did take my mind off things. 
Every day we'd wake up before dawn to start 17 hours of combat training, weapon cleaning, guard duty, political education, and much more. There was no time to think. No time to dwell. I hadn't thought about sports for a long time. But then one evening during inspection, our commander asked if any of us played football. Yes, commander. As soon as I heard the word football, my heart leapt. Playing football with the military was very... military-like. We were taken to the stadium at specific times and brought back when it was over. We weren't exempt from our military training, and we still had to report for duty. In 1949, Yashin got the opportunity of a lifetime. After one of our matches, a man in a suit stopped me on my way back to the locker room. Do I? Do I want to play in Dinamo Moscow? Of course I want to play in Dinamo Moscow! I couldn't believe it. This man was asking me if I wanted to play in the Soviet Union's top football club. Is that even a question? It was for the youth team and the man scouting Yashin was its coach. But with the military, how can I manage my time? Oh, you'll take care of it? All right then. In Soviet football, as in life, almost everything was political. One of the top clubs at the time was CSKA, Central Sports Club of the Army. Spartak was formed by trade unionist workers, and the state's favorite, Dinamo Moscow, belonged to the police. I was 20 and living the dream. The military agreed to let me join the Dinamo youth team. Maybe it had something to do with my new coach. Arkady Chernyshov was a football and ice hockey legend. Being mentored by an all-round athlete opened many doors for Yashin. I trained every day. No matter if I was tired or sleep-deprived, whatever, I wanted to prove to Chernyshov that he was right to take a chance on me. He always put me in the starting lineup, even though we didn't always see eye to eye. I knew my place, but I couldn't help it. When I saw the ball coming my way, my instinct was to run out and catch it. At the time, this was unheard of. Goalkeepers commonly spent the 90 minutes of play standing in the goal between the posts, waiting for the ball to come to them. But in Moscow in 1949, Yashin was unwittingly changing the game. Despite their early differences, Chernyshov came around to Yashin's way of playing. A few months into my time at Dinamo, he convinced the head coach of the first team to take a chance on me. I became the third goalkeeper a stand-in for Alexei Homich and Walter Sanaya. But I couldn't complain. I had Homich as my mentor. He's the man the British nicknamed the Tiger back in 1945. At my first training camp, our reserve team played against Tractor Stalingrad. That meant that neither Homich nor Sanaya were playing. It was all me. Focus, lad. Focus. You can do it. Just keep your eye on the ball. I'm embarrassed just thinking about it. The ball is coming to you now. All you have to do is catch it. It was a windy day. The tractor goalkeeper kicked the ball straight in my direction. I froze for a second, and then... All right, run towards the ball, but stay in the box where you can catch it. Oh, the wind is strong. It's going farther now. Okay, run back, run back. Now, just a few steps forward. I didn't see our defender rushing to help me. We crashed into each other and fell hard to the ground. The ball went straight into the net, from goal to goal. I stood there, my head bowed in shame while everyone, even my teammates, laughed at my stupid mistake. I was sure that was it for me, and at any minute now, I was going to be told that my football career 
was over before it even began. The tactic of coming out to catch the ball didn't work for him that time, but that very move that caused him so much embarrassment was the one that would put him on the path to becoming a goalkeeping legend. The coaches told me that the tractor goal was just a fluke accident, that these things happened. But things didn't get any better. Every chance I got to prove myself, I froze. I panicked. I moved too fast or too slow. No matter how hard I trained, I was still just a rookie. A rookie with promise. And not just in football. Being in the football reserve team meant I had some free time. Chernyshev, my former coach in the Dynamo youth team, could see that I was getting disheartened by the sport. So he got me into ice hockey. I hadn't even seen a puck before Chernyshev taught me how to play. He was one of the founders of the sport in the Soviet Union. So I was really being trained by the best. That year, in 1950, I joined the Dynamo ice hockey team. Guess what position I played? Yes, goalkeeper. But I wanted to. I secretly hoped it would help me practice my football goalkeeping techniques. But it wasn't easy to learn at first. Not at all. Oh. Oh, oh. Hit it with the stick! Don't catch it! Force of habit. <laughs> Back then, our gloves weren't padded. I can't tell you how much my hands hurt and bled. And even when I did catch the puck, it did slip and fly right into the net. Very different from football. If a football was an eagle, the puck was a fly. The hockey net itself was another story. Funny how in football I was chosen to stand in goal because of my height. But in hockey, I felt like a giant. 189 centimeters tall, wearing bulky armor, crouched in a small goal. But I fell in love with hockey, and I got really good at it. And soon, another part of my life began to unfold. Hey, Valentina, would you like to dance? <laughs> I don't think so. I was on the dance floor like every weekend when I met Valentina, my Valia. Our mutual friends introduced us. I don't think I made a good first impression. I wore bulky boots and my hands were calloused from hockey. She danced with another man, so I danced with her friend. At the end of the night, I offered to walk them both home. I pursued Valia for years. I took her out, gave her flowers, brought back gifts every time I traveled with Dinamo Moscow. We loved each other. But... She wasn't ready to take the big step. Okay, Valia. I'll wait. But we will be husband and wife one day, Leobov Maya. While Yashin waited for her to say yes, he played ice hockey and football. You got this, Tommy, eh? All right, Lev. Don't overthink it. I on the puck. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> I played hockey with the Dinamo Moscow team for three seasons, and in 1953, we won the Soviet Cup. After two and a half years of playing both sports, Yashin was turning into a formidable goalkeeper. And that year, he got the opportunity to prove his worth in football. Alexei Komic left Dinamo Moscow, promoting his protégé to the first team starting goalkeeper. This time, there was no more bumping into defenders, no more stupid mistakes. The debutant Dynamo goalkeeper walks onto the pitch for his first match with the first team. He's dressed in all black and wearing a hat, and uh, it looks like he just put out his cigarette seconds away from the kickoff whistle. Let's see how good this Yashin is. He had been in the reserve team for the past two and a half years. <laughs> In 1953, we won the Soviet Cup. I felt invincible. I was catching balls, kicking balls, uh, sometimes even punching balls. If the ball was too close, I would just head it with the hat on. <laughs> no one had seen anything like it. <laughs> Rival teams and officials with the Ministry of Sport 
criticized Yashin and his eccentric goalkeeping style. They called it the circus. But Yashin's ways couldn't be stopped. A year later, he was picked for the Soviet national football team. He was also nominated to compete in the Ice Hockey World Championships that same year. He had to make a decision. I loved hockey, but when it came down to it, I chose football. I would always choose football. Yashin's debut with the national team ended in a sweeping victory. The Soviet Union beat Sweden by seven goals in a friendly match. Fortune was smiling down on Yashin, and not only on the pitch. Well, it took four years, but in the autumn of 1954, Valia finally agreed to marry me. I picked the wedding date. New Year's Eve. The best way to end a year and welcome in a new one. After our wedding, I only had six days with Valia before I had to go away to training camp for two months. She was not happy about that. Having grown up in a crowded, poor, and war-ridden environment, Yashin discovered within him a true family man who craved stability and peace. We were in our mid-twenties when we got married. We both wanted children, and it wasn't long before we were blessed with our baby girl, Irina. And then another girl, who we named her Yelena. I know you wanted a son. Well, that was before I met this little angel. Yes, you're a little angel. I grew up with a baby brother. Then I worked in a factory, joined the military, and started playing football. I was always surrounded by boys. So coming home to my girls was a welcome change. I wish I had enjoyed it more. I spent almost half the year away from home in my football days. One of my favorite matches in those early years was with the national team against West Germany in the summer of 1955. They had won the World Cup the previous year and were in Moscow for a friendly. We didn't know what to expect. I wonder what their tactics are, huh? Eh? Do you think they're as good as they say? Oh, man, they beat that amazing Hungarian striker we got. Of course they're good. There was no way of knowing for sure. None of them had ever watched West Germany play. The 1954 World Cup was the first to be televised, but only in a few countries. The Soviets had to wait four more years before they could watch a World Cup match on TV. West Germany was good, but we were not too bad either. <laughs> the champions of the world, and we beat them three to two. West Germany was no ordinary opponent. Only ten years earlier, the two countries were at war. Now, in 1955, they were taking steps to mend the relations and promote peaceful coexistence through football. The Soviet Union arranged for 1,500 German fans to fly to Moscow to attend the match. That's one of the things I love about sport. It doesn't matter what's happening off the pitch. It's just about the game. Your love of football takes over, brings you together. It was a great match. The next couple of years were good ones. The Soviet national team won gold at the 1956 Summer Olympics. Yashin conceded only two goals in the whole tournament. Do you want to know my secret? Before a game, I smoked a cigarette to calm my nerves and sunk a nice vodka to tone my muscles. Back home, Yashin helped Dinamo Moscow win the Soviet championship for two consecutive seasons. That was also around the time Yashin joined the Communist Party. Sport in the Soviet Union was a means to an end. Displaying Soviet power to the world, and athletes were considered representatives of the state. Valya and I spent the first few years of our marriage crammed in a room in communal housing before the state gave us our own apartment. It was humble, but it was our home, and we never moved. I also never changed cars. I only drove my Volga. I liked what I had, so why look for more? He also played his entire professional career with one Soviet club. For the first time, our national football team qualified for the World Cup. In 1958, we headed to Sweden. 
We were the Olympic champions, so we felt confident. But oof, it was tough. We drew with England, and we beat Austria. And then we met Brazil. Volva, close him down! Boris, eye on the ball now! <sighs> the legends are true. Those Brazilian players are something else. Vava, Gorincha, Didi, and Pele in one team? It's a blessing we only lost by two goals. I don't know how I stopped all the other shots they fired at me. <laughs> Sweden knocked us out in the quarterfinals, but it wasn't a complete failure. Personally, I gained a lot. Experience, exposure... Friends. Valia, come meet my friend. This is Pele. This 17-year-old will become the greatest footballer in the world soon. Good luck, my friend. I'll see you in the next one. Valia, wait for me here. I just need to go to the bathroom. Throughout his career, Yashin had stomach ulcers. He would self-medicate with a solution of water and baking soda that he kept in a paper bag on him at all times. Coming back from Sweden, there was no celebration waiting for Yashin or the national team, for the world had gotten a glimpse of the black spider. I left the first time I heard that. I wish I had eight limbs to stop the ball. <laughs> but you know what's funny? I never actually wore black. It was just very dark blue. But those were the days of black and white pictures. Ryova, do you have to throw yourself on the ball every time? Your kid has turned the bad blood. <laughs> I'm sorry, Valia. I'm just living up to the name. <laughs> the 1958 World Cup surely put Yashin, as well as the Soviet national team, on the sporting world's radar. But the World Cup that followed in 1962 in Chile was a different story. We played Chile in the quarterfinals. It happened early on in the game. A Chilean player was entering the goal area. I had no choice but to throw myself at his feet to catch the ball. I did catch it, but I also got kicked in the head pretty hard. Uh, uh, what happened? Yashin was unconscious for a minute and a half. He played on anyway. No. I'm fine now. I can play. Just give me a hand up. <clears throat> Tolia, go for it! Gibby, get in line with the ball! Oh, here it comes. Go down. Unbelievable! The match ended 2-1 to one for Chile. When he scored the winning goal, Eladio Rojas ran, not to celebrate with his teammates, but to hug Yashin. The Chilean considered scoring on Yashin among the greatest of achievements. For the second time in a row, the Soviet Union's run at the World Cup ended in the quarterfinals. Live broadcasting from Chile wasn't possible at the time, so Soviet fans had to rely on newspapers to find out how their team was doing. The Soviet press was brutal. Yashin did not come through looking good. No one blamed me more than I blamed myself. Liova, you must sleep. You know that the journalists who blamed you for our loss were probably instructed to do so? To shift the blame from the team officials. It's not about that, Valia. What kind of a goalkeeper would I be if I wasn't tormented by the goals I allowed? I became public enemy number one. And then it hit too close to home. <laughs> Pack our things. We're going away for a while. Until they forget about it. I could deal with the taunting whistles on the pitch. And the insults they wrote on my car. But when it came to the safety of my family, when they started smashing the windows of my house, I couldn't take it anymore. There I was again, 21 years later, packing and leaving because it wasn't safe to stay home anymore. 
I told the coach I was finished with football. I packed my family and my fishing gear and drove off to the countryside. Irina, Yelena, look! Papuchka is going to catch a big fish. Ah, this is good. I can live like this. Okay, I couldn't live like that. I miss the game too much to be gone for long. Catching fish was a great break, but it could never amount to the satisfaction of catching a ball. Coach, I'm back. I'm ready to start playing again. Yashin was 34 now, and he hoped that by playing mostly away matches, news of his performance in other cities would travel to the capital and help him get back in the fans' good graces. It worked. By the end of the 1963 season, Dinamo Moscow were once again national champions. I was invited to play at the England versus rest of the world match that autumn in London. The match was a celebration of the 100th anniversary of football. The rest of the world team was made up of the best players in the world, selected by FIFA, and I was among them. Along with Eusebio, who became a dear friend of mine on that trip, Pushkash was there too. Soviet players reportedly didn't make as much money as European players had, and as one story goes, when Yashin and Pushkash went out for dinner one night in London, he was shocked when Pushkash took out his wallet to pay. I had never seen so much money in my life. But it was okay. I never wanted two things, money or to live outside the Soviet Union. The end of a fine first half. The crowd rising to the two teams, and I think especially to Lev Yashin, the Black Spider. England won, but it was on home soil, so that was okay. Once they saw how celebrated I was internationally, all was forgiven in Moscow. 1963 was a great year. In the 27 matches I played with Dynamo Moscow that season, I conceded only seven goals. And then, I got the highest award of my career, the Ballon d'Or. To this day, Yashin remains the only goalkeeper to win the prize. And in 2019, France football established the Yashin Trophy, presented annually to the best goalkeeper. In 1966, Yashin returned to England, this time with the Soviet team for the World Cup. Yashin received a superstar's welcome. Yashin! Yashin! Yashin, how ready are you for this tournament? Yashin, what do you think the Soviet's chances are? Yashin, do you think you'll make it past the quarterfinals this time? Please, I'm not answering any football questions today. I'm just here for the trout. <laughs> I even brought my fishing rod. I had a good feeling about this one. And let me tell you, it was our best tournament. The Soviets have made it to the quarterfinals against Hungary. The Black Spider stands in goal. Sheeposh is about to take a free kick. This could be dangerous. Focus now, comrade, and mark your men. Yashin leaps in the air and kicks it out. What a save. At 37, he's still in top form, taking his team to the semi-finals, where they'll meet West Germany. It was hard to believe that I got that chance to play in the World Cup again. Four years after everyone thought I had lost it, and I almost retired. In the end, we came in fourth place. Our best World Cup finish ever. Plenty of reason to celebrate. But Yashin's time on the pitch was coming to an end. In 1967, I played my last game with the national team. Three years later, I played my last match with Dinamo. I was 40 years old when I hung up my gloves. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I retired from playing, but I didn't quit football altogether. I mean, what else would I do? <laughs> 
I became the head coach of the Dynamo Moscow team for four years. All right, guys, that's enough for today. If you need anything, come find me in the office. I'm here all day. I loved work, and I think they liked me too. But Yashin's time was winding down. <clears throat> oh, it's getting worse lately. I was a heavy smoker most of my life. It was fine when I was playing, but after retiring, my health deteriorated. Football was my destiny. When I stopped playing, my body didn't know what to do with itself. In 1977, he suffered a heart attack. Then another in 1984. Oh, Valia. Don't cry. It's all right. What do I need that leg for? I don't play football anymore. Yashin had to have it amputated above the knee after suffering a blood clot. I got a lot of support. People from all over the world encouraged me to keep living my life. And I did. They all came to see me. For his 60th birthday, Dinamo Moscow hosted a match in his honor. Yashin entered the stadium in an open-top car, waving to the crowds who sang his name. It would be for the last time. A few months later, in March 1990, Yashin died of stomach cancer. Throughout his 22-year career, Yashin kept around 275 clean sheets, 275 matches where he conceded no goals. He also saved more than 150 penalty kicks for Dinamo Moscow and the Soviet Union, according to FIFA. The central Dinamo Stadium home ground for Dinamo Moscow is named in his honor. Moscow supporters still chant as the guiding star of his club and the standard to which generations of goalkeepers aspire. <laughs>